Expand your vocabulary with our core 2,000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free German ebook before it's gone. Hallo zusammen, mein Name ist Jenny. In dieser Lektion erzählen wir euch, wie Heiligabend in Deutschland gefeiert wird. Der Tag erinnert an Christi Geburt und findet immer am 24. Dezember statt. Dieses Fest zieht zu einem der wichtigsten Ereignisse in der christlichen Kirche. Was müssen viele deutsche Kinder tun, ehe sie ihre Geschenke bekommen? Wir verraten euch die Antwort am Ende des Videos. An Heiligabend haben die Geschäfte bis 14 Uhr geöffnet und einige Leute nutzen die Zeit noch für die letzten Weihnachtseinkäufe. Da der Tag kein Feiertag ist, müssen Berufstätige ihrer Arbeit nachgehen, wenn sie nicht Urlaub nehmen. Die Zeit bis zur Bescherung dient der Vorbereitung. Wer wohl die Geschenke bringt, ob Christkind oder Weihnachtsmann, ist regional verschieden. Der 24. Dezember wird meistens im Kreise der Familie gefeiert. Die Bescherung beginnt, wenn der Weihnachtsbaum geschmückt ist die Kerzen angezündet und die Geschenke verpackt sind. Kinder warten sehnsuchtsvoll auf diesen Moment und freuen sich besonders auf die Bescherung. Manche Familien bevorzugen an Heiligabend einfache Mahlzeiten wie beispielsweise Kartoffelsalat mit Würstchen, andere lieber aufwendigere Gerichte wie Gans oder Ente. Die Weihnachtsansprache des Bundespräsidenten wird im Fernsehen übertragen. Viele Menschen besuchen an Heiligabend einen Gottesdienst, der am Nachmittag oder am Abend meist mit Krippenspiel oder nachts als Christmette stattfindet. Ein festlich geschmückter Weihnachtsbaum und viele Kerzen lassen die Kirche hell erleuchten. Und während des Gottesdienstes werden viele bekannte Weihnachtslieder gesungen. Zum Beispiel Vom Himmel hoch, da komme ich her, O Tannenbaum, Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht und O du Fröhliche. In einigen Familien wird die Bescherung mit den Leuten eines kleines Glöckchens angekündigt. Darum warten viele Kinder an Heiligabend sehnsüchtig auf dieses Geräusch. Und nun noch die Antwort auf die Quizfrage von vorhin. Was müssen viele deutsche Kinder tun, ehe sie ihre Geschenke bekommen? In vielen Familien ist es üblich, dass die Kinder dem Weihnachtsmann oder Christkind zunächst ein Gedicht aufsagen, ein Lied vorsingen oder etwas auf einem Instrument vorspielen müssen. Erst danach dürfen sie ihre Geschenke auspacken. Wie hat euch dieses Video gefallen? Habt ihr etwas Interessantes gelernt? Wie feiert ihr Heiligabend in eurem Land? Hinterlasst einen Kommentar auf germanpod101.com. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is, are you an introvert or an extrovert? And how to speak more of your target language. Since you're learning the language, then you're very much aware of the importance of speaking, which can be easy if you're an extrovert or hard if you're an introvert. So. How can you speak more if you're on the shy side? Keep watching this month's episode. You'll discover who learns faster, extroverts or introverts, why learning a language can help you become more extroverted, and five ways to speak more, even if you're an introvert. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Sport and Exercise Conversation Cheat Sheet. Want to talk about fitness in your target language? You'll learn over 50 words and phrases for sports and exercise with this brand new cheat sheet. Second, the 40 words and phrases for ordering food writing workbook. With this free resource, you'll pick up must know words and phrases for the restaurant and practice writing them out as well. Third, the top 12 April Fool's phrases. Want to be able to say some outrageous phrases in your target language for April Fool's Day? Then you'll want this April Fool's phrase list. Fourth, can you talk about your bones in your target language? Learn how to say words like skull, ribs, spine, and much more with this quick vocab bonus. Fifth, 
20 must know jewelry vocabulary. Do you know how to say earrings or necklace in your target language? If you don't, then this vocab lesson is for you. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? And how to speak more of your target language. Part one, do extroverts or introverts learn languages faster? If you've ever wondered whether introverts or extroverts learn the language faster, there have been studies done on this. And as you'd expect, extroverts do have an advantage when it comes to speaking and overall conversational skills. Of course, these studies didn't take into account mistakes you may make, such as grammar, vocab, etc. And introverts? Introverts tend to observe and listen more and tend to be better listeners. Do you agree with these findings? Leave a comment. So the key takeaway is they each have their own advantages. One has something that the other lacks. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If you speak less, your speaking skills will be weaker. And if you want to just speak a lot, you get good at speaking, but miss out on the other skills like listening and reading. So unfortunately, you can't really say who learns faster based on personality alone, just that each one has their advantages and disadvantages. But personality aside, success with a language will always depend on your attitude towards learning itself and how much time you put in. The person that has a better chance of becoming fluent will always be the one that puts in more time to learn, practice, get feedback, adjust with the feedback, and not so much about whether they're extroverted or introverted. But what if you're an introvert who wants to be able to speak more? Is there a way to become more extroverted? Part two, how to speak more, even if you're an introvert. There are ways to become more extroverted, at least more than your usual self. How? Well, first by learning a language. When you learn a language, you have a natural desire to connect with native speakers, even if you're shy. Also, native speakers tend to be very supportive and welcoming when you're trying to learn their language. So even if you're shy, it's kind of hard to stay shy in the long run when the people you speak with are so encouraging. In your native language, even if you know a million ways to start a conversation, you might not try to speak to someone because you're worried about whether you have something clever to say or the timing or some other social aspect. But in another language, where you may only know a few phrases, you're not bogged down by that. You just do the best you can with the few phrases you have. Plus, learning a language alone gives you a chance to reinvent yourself. To learn another language is to acquire another soul, as the quote goes. So learning a language alone puts you on a path towards becoming more extroverted. But if you want specific tips, here are five ways to speak more, even if you're an introvert. Number one. Learn how to listen like an introvert. How can this help you to speak more? Introverts tend to listen more, and the better listener you become, the better questions you can ask, which results in a more meaningful conversation, which also means more speaking time for you. So you can speak more, even if you consider yourself an introvert, by listening well and asking relevant and pertinent questions. By the way, if you want to learn how to ask questions, then check out our top 25 questions you need to know, where you'll learn all about what to ask and answer regarding the most common conversational questions. Number two, increase speaking time and confidence through experience. Simply put, the more experiences you have in life or experience with certain topics, the more knowledgeable you become. And as your life or work experiences grow, so will your audience. You'll find people coming to you to talk to you. It could be about business, travel, or just your own life stories. If a conversation is about France, and if you've been to France, the conversation will gravitate towards you. Having all that experience makes things easy for you as an introvert. People will come to you, so you don't have to find them. For a language learner, the tricks are to, one, be knowledgeable about something, and two, be able to talk about your experience in the target language. Number three. Find the right audience. Imagine talking to someone that's not interested in learning languages. They'll give you 100 reasons why they can't learn, never reasons why it might work out for them, right? But when you're talking to an audience that's interested in languages, then you can have a conversation that could go on for hours. So find the right audience to share with. With language learning, it means you need to find native speakers that share the same hobbies or interests as you. Number four, talk about what you know best. 
The introvert-extrovert dynamic also depends on how much you know about a topic and what you're most comfortable with. There are topics you may not know enough about, so you won't talk as much. But even the biggest introvert can become a confident speaker. Once you touch upon a topic they know well, that's where they shine. So if your goal is to be more extroverted, then focus on the things you know about. Or you can always gain experience in topics you don't know much about so you can speak more. Number five, create opportunities to speak. How? Well, it's hard to stop a stranger and start talking with them without any context, right? But what if you need help finding something at a store or have a question about a dish at a restaurant? Then it's much easier since you're there with a purpose. So you can create these opportunities by going to a restaurant from the country that speaks your target language and speaking with the staff, or asking a taxi driver a question, or asking staff at an information booth a question. So to recap, if you want to speak more, even if you're an introvert, one, listen like an introvert. Two, increase speaking time and confidence through experience. Three, find the right audience. Four, talk about what you know best. And five, create opportunities to speak. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how tipping points will bring you closer to your language goals. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Hallo zusammen, mein Name ist Jenny. In dieser Lektion erzählen wir euch, wie Weihnachten in Deutschland gefeiert wird. Am 25. Dezember beginnt das eigentliche Weihnachtsfest. Und er ist wie der 26. Dezember ein gesetzlicher Feiertag. Nach christlichem Glauben ist der 25.12. so zentral, weil in der Nacht zuvor Jesus geboren wurde. Aufgrund dieses Ereignisses beginnt die eigentliche Weihnachtszeit mit dem 25.12., dem ersten Weihnachtsfeiertag, an dem sich die Menschen fröhliche Weihnachten oder frohes Fest wünschen. Wer komponierte das bekannteste Weihnachtsoratorium? Wir verraten euch die Antwort am Ende des Videos. Die ersten beiden Weihnachtsfeiertage liegen in den Weihnachtsferien, weshalb viele Familien die freien Tage nutzen, um Verwandte oder Freunde zu besuchen, um mit ihnen Weihnachten zu feiern. Dabei werden Geschenke überreicht, gemeinsam Plätzchen gegessen, ein weihnachtliches Spaziergang gemacht oder ein Weihnachtsgottesdienst besucht. In manchen Familien kommt am 25. oder am 26.12. die Weihnachtsgans auf den Tisch. Für dieses Festtagsessen gibt es unterschiedliche Zubereitungsarten. Einige füllen die Gans mit Äpfeln, Maronen oder Zwiebeln. Traditionell wird die Weihnachtsgans mit Knödeln, Rotkohl und Soße serviert. Unter vielen deutschen Weihnachtsbäumen werden bunte Weihnachtsställe angerichtet. Auf ihnen findet sich neben selbstgebackenen Plätzchen, Mandarinen, Äpfeln und Nüsse auch gekauftes Weihnachtsgebäck wie mit Schokolade, überzogene Dominosteine, Lebkuchen, Spekulatius und Marzipan. Häufig verwendete Gewürze für Weihnachtsgebäck sind Zimt, Nelken, Vanille und Anis. Der Christdorn ist ein typisches Weihnachtsgebäck, welches Rosinen und Bittermandel enthält und dick mit Puderzucker bestreut wird. Der größte Stollen wurde in Dresden gebacken und war 3,24 Meter lang, 1,77 Meter breit, 80 cm hoch und wog fast 3 Tonnen. Eine Tonne entspricht 1000 Kilogramm. Und nun noch die Antwort auf die Quizfrage von vorhin. Wer komponierte das bekannteste Weihnachtsoratorium? Das bekannteste Weihnachtsoratorium komponierte Johann Sebastian Bach, der 1685 in Eisenach geboren wurde und 1750 in Leipzig starb. Die Uraufführung fanden in den Jahren 1734 bis 1735 in der Nikolaikirche und in der Thomaskirche in Leipzig statt. Wie hat euch dieses Video gefallen? Habt ihr etwas Interessantes gelernt? Wie feiert ihr Weihnachten in eurem Land? Hinterlasst einen Kommentar auf germanpod101.com. Bis zum nächsten Mal.
Hey everyone, welcome to the Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is, can busy people actually learn a language? You yourself probably have an answer to this question, right? But whether you can or can't actually has a bit more to do with your mindset than anything else. And in this guide, you'll discover, one, is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? Two, mental bandwidth, the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Talking Online PDF Cheat Sheet. Learn the must-know internet slang and all the internet-related vocab and phrases in your target language with this PDF Cheat Sheet. And second, the 40 words and phrases for ordering food writing workbook. With this free resource, you'll pick up must-know words and phrases for the restaurant and practice writing them out as well. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Can busy people actually learn a language? Part one, is it possible for busy people to learn a language and the mindset needed? So can busy people actually learn a language? What do you think? Leave us a comment and let us know. As much as we want to say yes, it's more of a yes or no depending on the person. Why yes? Yes, because many of our members are busy and are learning with our system. And some of you who are watching also fall into this camp. But it also depends on the person because it's more of a mindset thing. Either you think you have time or you don't. For example, many of our members fall into the group of can learn and can find the time, even if they're busy. If you're busy and still want to learn, if you look around, you can always find five or 10 minutes a day, like on a commute. Now, if your mindset is the opposite, if you think you can't learn a language or you don't have time, you won't even try, even if you had a resource that was proven to work. Part two, mental bandwidth the one thing that can make or break your language goals. And if you think about it, if you had all the time in the world but felt like you couldn't learn a language, you wouldn't try either. Again, this is why it comes down to the mindset and why it all depends on each individual person. Either you think you can or you think you can't. But it may not always be this black and white either. It can also depend on your mental bandwidth too. Think back to your school days, those few days before exams. It got really busy and you had to stop everything to study, right? You were probably thinking, if I can just get through studying this week and take the test, then next week I can finally start relaxing and doing other things. And if someone asked you if you wanted to hang out, you would say no, because you're busy. But chances are you still managed to spend at least 30 minutes on YouTube or social media. Meaning you did have some time, even if you were busy. But the test was occupying your mind and taking up all that bandwidth. So it's also possible that we just don't have the mental bandwidth because we're overwhelmed. And this is a genuine reason for not being able to learn when you're busy. Don't worry, in the next part, we'll show you how to get some bandwidth so that you don't feel overwhelmed. Part three, five mindset tricks to make time for language. So if you've gotten this far, you understand that it is possible to start learning a language, even if you're busy, that you can find the time, but it mostly comes down to your mindset. So how can you develop the mindset? So when you're too busy, it feels like you're overwhelmed and like you don't have control of your time. Well, there are a few things you can do to gain some control of your time, have some breathing room and learn a bit of language. First, always set small, measurable goals. This is something that we talk a lot about here. For example, learn for 10, 15, or 20 minutes every day. Learn 100 words in one month, which means learning three to four words a day. 
And the mindset behind this is just being realistic with your goals and what you can do. Because if you're busy, you may not have one or two hours. And this is a strict rule, especially when starting out with new goals and languages. Always stick to small, measurable goals. Second, lowering your goals and expectations is okay when things get super busy. If you couldn't learn all 100 words for the month and only got up to 40 or 60, that's okay. If you tried learning on Monday and Tuesday but skipped Wednesday and Thursday, that's okay. Sometimes you have to shift priorities, and prioritizing things is a secret to a successful life. You may not get to the goal you wanted to achieve today, but you can get to it next week. Third, it's okay to put language on pause if life gets in the way. Just like with that last point, you can always come back and reach your goal a little later. We often see learners put language on pause, come back later. Some even come back years later. But the key is to come back. Fourth, avoid the all or nothing mindset at all costs. And an all or nothing mindset is something you'll see in beginners and perfectionists. When you have this mindset, you'll say, language learning requires hours, so there's no point in learning for a few minutes today. But something is better than nothing, and even five to 10 minutes of review adds up in the grand scheme. And in the grand scheme, it's more important to be consistent, even if it's just for a minute a day, rather than study for hours once a week. The brain just doesn't work that way. Fifth, do you have a slowdown or relaxing routine that you do on the weekends or whenever you have free time? And if you didn't do it, you'd feel overwhelmed? Leave us a comment and let us know what it is. For some, it could be reading, watching TV, or going to a cafe and doing nothing for a bit. You're there on your own, you don't have much to do in front of you, even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes. And if you're settled, you start feeling in control. And that's the point you have some mental bandwidth. You can start doing some time management and plan your week out. You can put in a few minutes of language learning. But if you don't slow down and if you feel overwhelmed, you could have the easiest possible way to learn a language. And you still wouldn't do it. So, back to you. If you were busy, do you think you'd be able to learn a language? Leave us a comment. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Do you record yourself speaking your target language? If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Hallo zusammen, mein Name ist Jenny. In dieser Lektion erzählen wir euch etwas über den bedeutendsten staatlichen Feiertag in Deutschland. Es ist der Tag der Deutschen Einheit und wird jährlich am 3. Oktober gefeiert. Vor dem Mauerfall war Deutschland in zwei Staaten geteilt. Die Deutsche Demokratische Republik, DDR, und die BRD, also die Bundesrepublik Deutschland. Seit der Wiedervereinigung im Jahre 1990 sind auch die ostdeutschen Bundesländer wieder ein Teil der Bundesrepublik. Die Berliner Mauer fiel am 9. November 1989. Warum wurde jedoch der 3. Oktober als Tag der Deutschen Einheit festgelegt? Wir verraten euch die Antwort am Ende des Videos. Die DDR-Regierung errichtete in der Nacht vom 12. auf den 13. August 1961 die Berliner Mauer, da sie die Flucht der Menschen in den Westen unterbinden wollte. Die Mauer riss Familien, die in Ost- und Westberlin lebten, auseinander und machte einen Besuch zwischen Freunden und Verwandten unmöglich. Während die ostdeutsche Bevölkerung nicht legal in den Westen reisen konnte, bestand auch für die westdeutsche Bevölkerung nur die Möglichkeit, über bestimmte Transitstrecken, die durch DDR führten, nach Westberlin zu reisen. In der DDR häuften sich 1989 die Proteste. Viele Bürger forderten Reisefreiheit statt Massenflucht und taten ihren Unmut in den Friedensgebeten unter anderem in Leipzig in der Nikolaikirche kund. Der Leitspruch der Montagsdemonstration war, wir sind das Volk. Die friedliche Revolution entwickelte sich zu einer Massenbewegung in der gesamten DDR und erhöhte damit den Druck auf die DDR-Regierung, die Mauer am 9. November 1989 zu öffnen.
Anlässlich des 3. Oktobers findet jährlich in unterschiedlichen Landeshauptstädten ein Bürgerfest statt, welches auch Ländermeile genannt wird und bei dem Jung und Alt die Wiedervereinigung Deutschlands feiern. Ebenso laden seit einigen Jahren in Berlin Konzerte am Brandenburger Tor und der Straße des 17. Juni zum Besuch ein. Der Begriff Ostalgie, welches ein Kunstwort aus Osten und Nostalgie ist, beschreibt die gegenwärtig bestehende Neugierde an der ostdeutschen Lebensweise, sowie das Interesse an ehemaligen DDR-Produkten, wie zum Beispiel dem Trabanten oder dem Ampelmännchen. Und nun noch die Antwort auf die Quizfrage von vorhin. Warum wurde jedoch der 3. Oktober als Tag der Deutschen Einheit festgelegt? Mit der Unterzeichnung des Einigungsvertrags wurde am 3. Oktober 1990 die Wiedervereinigung vollzogen. Da der 9. November durch andere historische Ereignisse negativ vorbelastet ist, wurde der 3. Oktober zum Tag der Deutschen Einheit. Wie hat euch dieses Video gefallen? Habt ihr etwas Interessantes gelernt? In welchen Festen wird an die Geschichte eures Landes erinnert? Hinterlasst einen Kommentar auf germanpod101.com. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is how to learn a language in 2022. If you're planning to learn a language in 2022, then this episode is for you especially if you want to finally succeed with your New Year's resolution, instead of failing or giving up in the next week or two. That's why today you'll discover, one, the four critical steps you need to take when learning a new language, and two, how to set goals and New Year's resolutions that won't fail you in 2022. But first, if you're looking for some free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Using Opposites Conversation Cheat Sheet. With this new cheat sheet, you'll learn common opposite adjectives like near and far, hot and cold, and grammar rules on how to use these words in a sentence. Second, the How to Say Goodbye PDF Writing Workbook. With this printable PDF, you'll pick up some common parting greetings and be able to practice writing them out. Third, can you talk about cars in your target language? Learn how to say words like tire, windshield, headlights, and more with this quick vocab bonus. Fourth, must know words and phrases for public transportation. Learn how to say ticket, bus, train, and much more with this quick one minute lesson. Fifth, the 10 habits of highly effective language learners. Wondering which habits will help you succeed with language learning? Then check out this free lesson. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. How to learn a language in 2022. Part one, the four critical steps you need to take when learning a new language. Every time you start a new language, you should start with one, goals, two, anchor points, three, grammar, four, reading. What are these four steps and why do you need them to succeed with language learning? Let's jump in. The first one is goals. Everything starts with a goal, but your goal itself can also lead you to failure if you don't set it the right way. So more specifically, you need to set small, measurable monthly goals instead of just, I wanna learn a language and be fluent this year. We'll cover goals in the second part of this episode, so stay tuned. After goals, the second step is setting anchor points. What are anchor points? Imagine a small ship in the middle of a big lake. It's windy, lots of waves, and the ship is bobbing up and down, drifting all around. What would you use to stop the ship from drifting away? An anchor. And just like an anchor keeps the ship in place, anchor points keep you from drifting away from your language. So an anchor point is a connection to the language that keeps you attached to the language and motivated to learn the language. One great example is language school. Imagine you signed up and paid thousands of dollars up front. Paying that much would motivate you to make the most of your time there. 
It's also a big commitment, one that you can't easily back out of. And school dictates your schedule. You have to wake up early, you have to do homework. Your life revolves around the classes. And as such, language school and the language itself become anchor points that your life revolves around. Anchor points can also be family or a partner that speaks the language you're learning. You're around them, you're exposed to the language, so your motivation to learn gets a bit stronger. Buying a language learning program or textbook are also examples of good anchor points. You invested your hard-earned money, which means you're serious about learning. Plus, you want to make sure your investment doesn't go to waste, so you're more motivated. If you're wondering if you have any anchor points, you already have at least one. You're watching our lessons on YouTube. But the more anchor points you have, the stronger your motivation will be. So if you're into music or TV shows in your target language, those can serve as anchor points too. These are things that connect you to the language and add a bit of motivation to learn more, or at the very least, understand what you're watching or listening to. We covered goals and anchor points. What's next? The third step is you must have a good grasp of grammar of your native language. Now, you might wonder, if you're learning a new language, why focus on your native language? Well, as native speakers, the problem is we know what good grammar sounds like, but we can't explain how or why our language works the way it works. So if you don't have a good grasp of grammar, the backbone or the rules of a language, then you'll have a tough time learning a new language. You'll jump in and start learning words and phrases, but you'll never learn how to put them together and make sentences. That's a common problem beginners have. Now, if you already know the grammar of your native language, how do you apply that to your target language? For example, if you're an English speaker, and if you know that English sentences follow the subject, verb, object pattern, and if you know that languages have specific sentence patterns, then you'd go look at patterns. Then, you'd have a good idea of how to create your own sentences, instead of learning random words first. Finally, the fourth step is reading. Reading is good simply because you can do it anywhere, anytime, and without a teacher. It's a skill you can get started on, on day one, on your own. Reading also tends to spill over into other areas. The more you read, the more words and grammar rules you come across. So you boost your vocabulary and grammar, which can seep into speaking and listening. If you read out loud, you're practicing two skills at once. Now we've covered what you need. Goals, anchor points, reading, and grammar. Setting anchor points, knowing your own grammar and reading are simple enough, but how do you set goals that don't lead you to failure? Part two, how to set goals and New Year's resolutions that won't fail you in 2022. The goal that you set can make or break your language learning journey. So setting the right goals makes all the difference between success and failure. Just think about all of the common New Year's resolutions. What comes to mind? Goals like, I want to be fluent someday. I want to speak the language. I want to lose weight. I want to save more money. These big, vague goals often lead to failure because you simply have no idea how to approach the goal and you don't know what you're aiming for. Instead, your goals should be small, measurable, and monthly. For example, speak one minute of conversation by the end of the month. Learn 100 words by the end of the month. Finish chapter one of your language textbook by the end of the month. If you're using our program, finish 20 audio lessons by the end of the month. All of these are small and specific. One minute, 100 words, one chapter, 20 audio lessons. This means that they're easy to reach, unlike something vague like fluency. They're also measurable. You know when you reach one minute. You can check if you know all 100 words or if you finished all 20 lessons. If you aim for fluency, you won't know when you hit it. It's too vague and too big of a goal and it may take years to hit. Finally, all of these goals have a deadline, the end of the month. That would mean January 31st of this year. Deadlines give you a clear date to aim for, and without one, you'll forever be floating around without much progress. So set a deadline for the end of every month. So now that you know how to set small, measurable monthly goals, leave us a comment. What's your small, measurable monthly goal? And what's the deadline? So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye.
Hallo zusammen, mein Name ist Jenny. In dieser Lektion erzählen wir euch, wie Ostern in Deutschland gefeiert wird. Mit dem Ostersonntag beginnt die Osterzeit, die 50 Tage bis einschließlich Pfingsten dauert. Ostersonntag findet jedes Jahr an einem anderen Datum statt, da der genaue Tag sich nach dem ersten Frühlingsmond richtet. Der Frühlingsvollmond findet zwischen dem 21. März und dem 19. April statt und das Osterfest wird dann an dem nachfolgenden Sonntag gefeiert. Warum werden an Ostern so viele Eier verzehrt? Wir verraten euch die Antwort am Ende des Videos. An diesem hohen christlichen Feiertag feiern die Gläubigen die Auferstehung Jesu Christi in der Osternacht. In manchen Kirchen findet der Gottesdienst am Vorabend nach Einbruch der Dämmerung statt. Am Osterfeuer wird eine große Kerze aus Bienenwachs angezündet. Die sogenannte Osterkerze soll während der gesamten Osterzeit brennen. An Ostern wünsche sich die Menschen frohe Ostern und manche verschicken Ostergrüße sogar mit der Post. In Geschäften werden Ostersüßigkeiten wie Osterhasen und Ostereier, die meistens aus Schokolade sind, verkauft. Viele Leute dekorieren auch ihr Zuhause, indem sie Osterkörbchen aufstellen. Zum traditionellen Osterfrühstück gehört süßes oder herzhaftes Osterbrot, welches das Ende der Fastenzeit markiert. Am Ostersonntag begeben sich in vielen Familien Kinder noch vor dem Frühstück auf Ostereiersuche. Dafür werden hartgekochte Hühnereier verwendet die zuvor mit Motiven verzerrt, bemalt oder gefärbt und anschließend versteckt werden. Meist werden die gefundenen Ostereier dann beim gemeinsamen Osterfrühstück verzerrt. Nach dem Glauben kleiner Kinder werden die Ostereier vom Osterhasen versteckt. Manche Kinder bekommen auch Schokolade oder ein Spielzeug versteckt, das sie auch erst suchen müssen. An Ostern gibt es verschiedene Bräuche. Ein Osterspiel ist zum Beispiel das Ostereiertittchen. Bei diesem Spiel stoßen die Mitspieler abwechselnd mit der vorderen Spitze eines Eies auf die vordere Eispitze ihres Kontrahenten. Dabei versucht jeder, dass sein Ei so lange wie möglich unversehrt bleibt. Und nun noch die Antwort auf die Quizfrage von vorhin. Warum werden an Ostern so viele Eier verzehrt? Früher schrieb das Abstinenzgebot vor, während der Fastenzeit nicht nur auf Fleisch, sondern auch auf tierische Produkte zu verzichten. Dies hat sicherlich dazu beigetragen, warum sich der Verzehr von Eiern an Ostern zu einem Brauch entwickelt hat. Man durfte endlich wieder Eier essen. Wie hat euch dieses Video gefallen? Habt ihr etwas Interessantes gelernt? Gibt es in eurem Land auch lustige Bräuche zu Ostern? Hinterlasst einen Kommentar auf germanpod101.com. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Expand your vocabulary with our core 2000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free German ebook before it's gone.